in the face of, of ego or us humans. We have a tendency to be selfish. As a parent, you know, we encourage our kids to share because most of the time uh, we don't want to do that when it's something. that we really like, uh, so we, we need to get over that idea. Just think of what it would be like if we were more merciful in the church, of what it would be like if our country was more merciful, was more patient with one another. When a particular group doesn't get its way, instead of burning down the way, they would take the time and be patient and try to, through legal and means of communication, uh, coerce or help the other side to see their position. Uh, think about how much more peace there would be in our society if people manifested themselves in such a way and tried to encourage each other. That's one of the things as a Christian that's uh, hard for me. A lot of times uh, I want to press a point so hard that I change my attitude, maybe even my voice, maybe even my reflection. Now, I think voice reflection is important in public speaking. But don't want to get to the point where you change that to where you lose people. And they think that you're mad or you're angry. We're not. We're dead serious about this. We're so passionate about Jesus and passionate about this is the only way that will work for man. And we want other people to see that so desperately. And uh, sometimes our temperament, and this is one of the things that I've looked at and will continue to look at and need to look at, sometimes our temperament doesn't G and haw with the gospel. Sometimes we're not Christ-like in some of our deportment. And, so, deportment. and so it's important that we realize that. Uh, some of us are good enough to have spouses who bring that to our attention on an hourly ba I mean, uh, uh, you know, on a regular basis. And uh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing because if we're not careful, we can actually countermand what we're trying uh, to accomplish. So when we look at this idea, blessed are the merciful, it's one that has a benefit that all of us can understand very quickly. Why? Well, if we're merciful, we shall obtain mercy. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those, our debtors, you know, those who transgress. Forgive us our transgressions as we forgive those who've transgressed us. Now, there's limitations to that, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But um, we need to be forgiving people. Now, when it comes to forgiving somebody, just like God, we, we have to be careful that we don't enable people to continue to do evil that when it comes to forgiveness, we realize first and foremost there must be repentance. Now, I'm not saying that we should have a grudge against somebody that isn't repentant towards us, but that we can't just simply continue to overlook what they're doing or we will enable them to keep doing that, and that will not help them. They will be lost as a result of continuing to sin. So it's important that when we think about being merciful that we get the right attitude, and hopefully we'll develop that as we go. Mercy hindered. Selfishness always jumps in the face of mercy. Uh, that's the thing as a Christian that we must try to head off. In Luke chapter 12, we have an excellent example of selfishness, probably the finest example I think that we could find in the New Testament, one that's just so clear. In Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 13, says, one come and, one, and one of the company, Jesus has been preaching, said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who hath made me a judge or a divider over you? Now we look at that, and immediately we can uh, get the wrong impression about Jesus' attitude here. Just like when his wife, uh, his wife, <laughs> boy, that would be something, right? Just like when his mother says they have run out of wine in Mark chapter 2. Do you remember he says, Woman, you know, uh, that's not my time, you know. He's not being disrespectful there, and he's not, you know, today we say, hey, man, you know, sometimes we can be saying that in a way that's uh, disrespectful or uh, maybe even a little agitated. But the word there in the Greek is simply, we might today say, sir, you know, it's, it's a polite, it's just the word for man, 
Same thing when he talks to his mother. We very well could say ma'am, uh, you know, in address. Uh, it's not being ugly at all. But he says, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? In other words, I'm not in a position to tell your uh, brother what he should or shouldn't do when it comes to this world stuff. I'm not a civil judge. He says, but notice he says, and this is what preempts this parable. He said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. You could stick the word selfishness in there and you would do that no disjustice. Covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he has or possesses. And he spake a parable unto him. We all know this parable. It's a rich man and he hits a home run. He hits a bumper crop like nothing you've ever seen. If they had Forbes magazine back in the Hebrew times, then he would have made the cover of it because he just, it was more than he knew what to do with. He had crops literally running out of his ears and just, what am I going to do? Well, instead of thinking about anybody in this world, he thought simply of himself. He said, I'll build, build bigger barns and then I'll have, this, I'll have this place to bestow my fruits. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But notice in verse 20, God said unto him, Thou fool. You see, when we start thinking selfishly, we stop thinking about the kingdom of God. We stop thinking about the important things of the world, and all we're thinking about is ourselves. God called this man a fool. He said, This night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then he says something that the Ecclesiastes writer spends a lot of time with. Ecclesiastes writer says, you gain all this money, you get all this wealth, and then what happens? You die, and somebody else gets it. And he says, how do you know that your inheritor or your heir is not a fool? And that what you spend all this time and effort accumulating, he just, you know, goes through so quickly and just, you know, spends it, and it's, it's gone. How many times have we seen people do that? That's the same idea God says here. Who's all this stuff going to be? Who's all this stuff going to be that you have provided? So he that layeth up treasure for himself is not rich toward God is what Jesus is trying to get home here this is preempted he's in a sermon he's preaching he's trying to teach people the gospel and a man says hey my brother won't share that stuff with me he's not dividing the inheritance like I want him to and Jesus says you need to think about covetousness. you need to be worried about how selfish you are here there's more important things mercy described first of all when we talk about mercy it's passion it's a passionate word to extend to mercy. Have you ever been called to the office? Have you ever been called before your uh, superior and you knew you were in trouble? You knew things, you knew that you had done wrong and here it comes. You ever had, you ever been in that situation? I know none of y'all have, only me, right? You, what do you want when you're standing on that carpet, so to speak? When you're standing before the principal, you're standing before the coach, uh, what do you want? We're wanting to have some mercy extended. We're, uh, we, we realize we've done wrong most of the time. And so we're hoping that they won't drop the hammer on us, if you will. So it's a passionate word. You cannot extend, extend mercy if you're not passionate about it. You've got to really care about people. And for you know that's hard sometimes to develop. It's hard to care about some people. But Jesus would say, you know... Uh, if you only love or you only care about those who care about you, he says, what's that saying about anything? He says, even the Gentiles or folks that are not concerned about God, they do that. If somebody loves them, they love them back, that's normal. What's not normal is to love those that don't like you, that hate you. And Jesus would teach things about bless those that, that hate you and treat you badly. We'll see that at the end. Uh, we'll see that as a result of this character that we're trying to build in the Beatitudes. That's where it goes against the grain. That's the hard part. When I am kind and I pray for and I think about and I try to help those who mistreat me and have brought me great problems. So mercy is passionate and it involves performance. It's something that I have to do. I cannot just say, boy, I sure do hope things go well for old brother so and so. You know, I know he's in a pickle over there, and I sure do hate it. But uh, you know, I'm thinking about him. Well, notice what James says about that. In James, in James chapter two, verse fifteen, he says, "If a brother or a sister doesn't have proper clothing," King James uses the idea of being naked, not properly clothed, not being nude, but not being properly clothed, and destitute of daily 
food. Brethren, this reminds me of years ago. I had just started preaching. And a man that uh, I would later on baptize and uh, is now a gospel preacher told me about uh, some folks where he worked. And he asked me, he said, do you have uh, any extra jackets? And I said, what do you mean do I have any extra jackets? He said, I mean coats. I mean like, and I was like, you know, what are you talking about? Are you talking about like cold, cold weather coat, dress coat, what? He said, no, I mean like somebody's cold, they need a coat. Do you have any extra? And I was like, well, I've got a whole closet full of coats. And he said, you think you could bring me a couple? There's some men at work who don't have a coat. I mean, they didn't have a coat. You know, something that I take for granted, go to the, uh, sometimes I'm disappointed because I don't have the particular one or style or whatever. I, I, but to be cold, to be cold because you don't have proper clothing. This was only a couple of decades ago in Bledsoe County. And so, uh, yes. And, you know, occasionally I would see one of those coats go down the street there in Pikeville. And uh, it did my heart so much good. There was people that really did not have adequate clothing. For most of us, we don't understand that. Uh, most of us, I know you ladies, sometimes you only got 40, 50 pairs of shoes and you just don't have the right flats to go with that outfit, right? But, you know, there are people who only have one or two pa or sometimes no shoes. Uh, that's hard for us to get our rope around sometimes. We live in a very blessed society. And for the most time, most of the times, I think uh, it just flows from Christianity. Christians have this tendency to work. They have a tendency to work hard. They have a tendency to save. They have a tendency to be good citizens. They, they're responsible. And so as David would say, I just haven't seen many servants of God begging bread or not having adequate clothing. That takes us to our communities where that's not the case. A lot of times there are people, there are children who uh, don't really have control of the situation that they're in, and therefore they go uh, without a lot of times. And I'm thankful for the various drives that we have in our community and town for supplies and so forth. It's just so uh, hard to make sure those are done well and, and improperly and not abused. And I'm thankful that we have folks around here that do that. I'm thankful for what we do around here for a couple of families from time to time. But destitute of daily food. Um, James says, if you know somebody in this situation, and you say unto them, well, boy, you know, go in peace. I, I wish you the best, you know, and I hope that you can stay around a, a fire, you know, and I, I hope that uh, you can get some food somewhere, you know. I hope you're filled. And he says, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. He says, what doth it profit? In reality, what have you done for them? Not that prayer is not a good thing, but when somebody is actually hungry. That's why, you know, me and my wife, uh, we're not doing a good job of it, but we're trying. We're trying to keep foodstuffs in the automobile. I don't know how many of y'all go North ter Terrace or South Terrace, but that must be the hottest uh, corners in all of Chattanooga, I believe, for uh, panhandling. And so what's the fear? Well, you don't want to buy people tobacco. You don't want to buy people alcohol. You don't want to buy them things that are going to cause them to stay in the same situation they are, they are in. But one of the things you can do is give somebody a drink of water. You can give them some foodstuffs. You can also give them a card. You can also say, you know, there's a Church of Christ just two blocks over there. I guarantee you if you go over and knock on their door, there's going to be somebody there that's going to help you if that's what you desire. I know that we're, uh, we see this all the time now. Man, if you go south of, of here, where warmer climates, same thing you have in uh, the West Coast with California and the Mediterranean climate, you have people who just said, hey, you know what? I don't need a job. I don't need a house. I can just live out here on the beach. And uh, so that's a very popular thing. And we don't want to encourage people not to work. That being said, there are those who find themselves from time to time in a position where they can't or they have bills that are more than they can afford, and so they find themselves, and it's hard. That's when we have to use judgment. And I encourage you, though, try to use good judgment. But it's important that we do something, not just say, well, boy, I hope you stay warm. I hope you, you, know, you do this. And you have to be safe about it as well. There are places and things and folks that handle this kind of thing and, and can be there for them in secure ways. I'm not asking any 
somebody to open up their automobiles or bring people into your life that uh, could cause you harm and so forth. We need to be smart about these things. But at the same time, don't turn a deaf ear to complaints. And I know that's a hard thing to determine. Judgment, that's what we were talking about. In Matthew chapter 18, here, here's a situation that I'd like for you to turn there with me, if you will. These passages were just simply too large to uh, try to pull off, pull over all the slides. But in Matthew 18, beginning of verse 22, there's a king. You know this parable. This king, he's going to take account of his servants. In other words, he's bringing people in front of him that owe him money. And so he had this one. He begins to reckon. He's getting the books out, if you will. He's going to balance the what's owed to what needs to be paid and so forth. And one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, friends, that's more money than you and I and probably everybody in this building could make in a lifetime. It's millions of dollars. This guy is so far in hock to the king that he could never get out. And notice, but for as much as he had not to pay. So the king says, well, you know, I've got to kind of cut my losses here. And so he did something that was very common in that time. He commands that this man be sold and his wife and his children and that, you know, that be applied to this great debt that this man owed. But notice the servant falls down and worships him, saying, Lord, have patience. The idea of worship here is simply to, to prostrate oneself, to, to kiss towards, to, to beg, if you will. Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Well, now, the king's not naive. He realizes this man couldn't in a hundred lifetimes come from nothing and pay off this debt. But notice, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him that debt. But this same servant who just, I mean, forgave the debt. Listen, wiped it clean. You no longer owe millions of dollars. You can go out and you can start fresh. This same man goes out and finds a fellow servant. And this fellow servant owed him 100 pence. Folks, that's like 17 cents. And what does this servant do instead of just saying, you know, man, I just got the luckiest break of anybody could get in their life. Don't you worry about that. Uh, just, just No. He takes him, grabs him, treats him roughly, man, grabs him by the throat. You know, somebody grabs you by the throat, uh, they get your attention. And so this fellow grabs him by the throat and says, you know, what does the, the, the servant that he grabs by the throat says, man, have patience with me. I'll pay you. There's a very good chance this guy could find a day's work. He could pay this debt, but instead of doing that, this man says, no, not so. You're going to jail and puts him in, which I've always thought was kind of funny, debtor's prison. Be put into prison <laughs> because you owe somebody money. It's not like you're going to make a, job, a living in there and, can, and help him. But anyway, he does that. Well, this comes to the king's ears. Now, remember, the king's all powerful. He has the right to, uh, you know, put somebody in jail and so forth. And so he comes to his ears that this man that he had forgiven so much and it showed so much mercy doesn't show that same kind of mercy. As a matter of fact, doesn't show any mercy. And so what does he do? He has him uh, put into a prison till he should pay all that was due unto him. And so Jesus uses that as an illustration. So likewise shall my Father do also unto you if your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. But there has to be some judgment there. What do I mean by that? We said earlier, it's important that we understand that when we just overlook sin, we enable sinners to continue to do that. That's not going to help them in the big scheme of things. It's going to cost them to lose their soul. Mercy also is a, there's a price. It's going to cost you something. Mercy is going to be something that's going to have a price for you, even emotionally, or, or whatever, but it's going to have, or, or financially, it's going to cost you something. And notice this mercy is to be extended with cheerfulness. Paul would say, he that ex these are gifts of the early church. It says, he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth well, uh, ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. In other words, don't say, man, I've got to show this guy mercy. The Lord made me. Don't be like that. Do it with cheerfulness. Be happy about it. Notice, mercy is also something that's needed. If you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 6. This is, a, this is what some would call this a parallel passage. I'm not so quick to, to hop on that idea. This particular sermon is called the Sermon on the Plain, 
where we have in Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, there are some differences. Some people see similarities, and they are there, sometimes word for word. And they say, well, it's got to be the same sermon. Well, if you've heard me preach, and I know you have, uh, y'all have been listening to me for years, and I'm thankful for that, but you've heard me say the same things. You've heard me use the same illustrations. I try to, you know, change those from time to time, of course. But Jesus did the same thing. That's why I don't have a hard time saying it doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same sermon. Notice he said, as that you would men should do to you. We call this the golden rule, right? Do you also to them likewise? For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank ye? For sinners also do even the same. If you lend to them with hope of receiving, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive much again. But love your, ye your enemies, and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be called the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Why should we be merciful? Because it is a characteristic of God. And remember we talked about those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. To be godlike is to be righteous. And be righteous is to be merciful, just like God is. Don't you want to stand before the throne of grace? As we're divided the sheep from the goats, and hear thou, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, I want to hear that. I want to hear that so bad. But I've got to, in this life, be willing to forgive those who ask for my forgiveness. Notice mercy distinguished. And this is what I wanted to spend some time with. There are two uh, perverted definitions of mercy. The first one we would call toleration of evil. Uh, homosexuality is a bane to society. It is wrong now. It was wrong uh, in the beginning. Uh, in Genesis, uh, excuse me, in the Old Covenant, in the book of Leviticus chapter 18, it was wrong for men to lie with men. Uh, as with a woman, it is abomination. We find in the time of uh, before that, Genesis chapter 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a sin. Today, in Romans chapter 1, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, Galatians chapter 5, we find that it is still referred to as a sin, yet our society says it's not. And so we tolerate it, and many preachers don't preach on the sin of homosexuality anymore. As a matter of fact, many people who call themselves preachers today practice homosexuality. That is a toleration of sin, and that is not equivalent to mercy. We can't extend mercy where God has not. We can't extend, we can't call that which is good, which God has said is evil. Our country even has a thing that we, we even refer to it as the sin tax on alcohol and tobacco and things of that nature, in which we're saying, oh, well, people are going to do it anyway, so we might as well make a little jack off of it, right? Uh, same thing with legalizing uh, marijuana. I thought it was funny the other day. Uh, uh, this past week, I was reading a study in, in, a, in a newspaper that said that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> smoking marijuana is linked to heart problems. Well, who's the genius that figured that out? We've been saying that forever. Ten, smoking marijuana has been ten times worse as far as causing cancer in the lungs, emphysema, and everything from the beginning. But people love to have it so. And so what do we do? We throw a tax on it and say, well, okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 at verse 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the heart of man is set to do evil continually. In other words, because people aren't punished, or if they are punished, it's, it's years down the road, uh, you know, toleration of sin is not what mercy means. Also, leniency of punishment. There's a thing called justice. And when we talk about justice, a lot of times we're talking about mercy extended to the victims. You know, there's a reason that God said in Genesis chapter 9 at verse 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man's hand shall his blood be shed. But yet, you have a capital punishment being carried out by a state who has the right to bear the sword. Romans chapter 13. Man has been convicted. He's went through the appeals process. And there's no doubt about it. Smoking gun, DNA, whatever. You will have some people in the name of God go out and protest against that and say that it's not God's will that this be done when the Bible itself says that is indeed 
the will of God. The Old Testament is chock full with capital crimes. I believe there were some 12 or 13 crimes which were punishable by death. Now, a lot of people say, well, that was the old law, and now this is the new law. Folks, Romans 13 is a part of the new law, and the powers that be beareth not the sword in vain. The government has the duty and responsibility to punish the evildoer and to reward that person. Leniency of punishment is not the answer. Uh, how many times do you watch uh, shows where people who have been convicted of murder have went to prison and are back out commit yet another murder? If we were following the laws of God, then this would not happen. And, of course, by murder, we're talking about premeditated murder. Exodus 23 at verse 2. Now, this is from the New American Standard. I think it helps smooth out the next verse a little bit. It says, you shall not follow the masses in doing evil. We're more familiar with the King James there. It says, you not follow a multitude to do evil. Nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. In other words, what? You don't lie. You don't make something up. And you don't try to build the case of the person that you're trying to help in a court of law. You state the truth. Notice the next verse says, Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. What's that saying? You don't be partial to anybody. You're not partial to the rich because he can scratch your back later. You're not partial to the poor because you feel sorry for him because he doesn't have anything. Right is right. Just is just. And so when somebody is convicted of a crime, they are convicted most of the time, especially in these uh, violent crimes, the, the mercy that the courts are extending is actually towards the victim to punish the evildoer. Notice mercy displayed. Luke chapter 10, if you turn there with me, you know this. <clears throat> That's one of the things I love about parables. Parables ingrain things in our mind from little kids. Why it's so ingrained in our mind, they even used it as Seinfeld. I believe it was the last episode of the Seinfeld show. Remember what that was about? They had failed to obey. What law was it? Remember? Anybody? Can you not talk through those masks? The Good Samaritan Law. Yes, well, when you think of Good Samaritan, you immediately know what that's talking about. Yes, this is mercy displayed. In Luke chapter 10, notice uh, <clears throat> verse 30. Well, actually, you have a lawyer, uh, you know, wants to uh, justify himself in verse 29 and ask Jesus, well, uh, who exactly is my neighbor? Remember, God, Jesus had told him the greatest law was to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He said, second, like unto it, love thy neighbor as yourself. The, the lawyer says, well, who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus is going to draw him a picture so clear that there's no way in the world he could get around it. He said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Just happenstance. First of all, it's a sad thing. He's traveling by himself. Probably would, not have, would have preferred not to, but he happens to be. And he falls among thieves. And I want you to, if you don't, if you believe in marking your Bibles, I don't know these, uh, these new ones, maybe you can highlight it on your phone or whatever. Notice that third word of verse 31 if you're using the King James. And by chance. You know, there's people who would tell you that everything that happens out there, God did it. Little baby dies, God did it. But it all comes out for good, so God killed that baby for good. Oh, that jet plane that crashed all them people on it. Well, God did it. No. Friends, see, God started this world, put certain laws into effect, and those laws are help us to be able to fly an airplane. Gravity is always going to be there. Our bodies sometimes uh, don't come out quite right. There's messes up in the, the biology, the genes, things of that nature. But God, notice this is by chance. God didn't make these people uh, go by. This is something that happened by chance. That's a huge word. I think in all of the New Testament, because a lot of people would have you to believe that every single act that takes place from your wanting oranges when you walk by the fruit stand to uh, whatever is God's causing that to happen. Well, my friends, that's simply not the case. Here we have a man, and by chance there came down, notice two religious workers, a priest and a Levite. They're on their way to Jerusalem. Why? They've got to go to work. they got church to do. And yet what do they do? You know the story. They pass by on the other side. Then you have a man who is, uh, there's a good chance this fella who's from Samaria would have recognized this man as being a Jew. Why is that? Well, the Jews dressed in a certain way to, dis to distinct, you know, to make a distinction between themselves and Gentiles. Maybe it would have been the way he had his hair braided. Maybe it would have been the way he wore his beard. 
Maybe it had been the very clothing they had on with the extended uh, borders on his garment. But there's a good chance this Samaritan knew that this was a Jew laying here. Good, good probability the priest and Levite did as well. But what does he do? He doesn't say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a racist. I don't like those Jews. They don't like us and go on. No, what does he do? Remember we said earlier, it's, it's going to cost you. Passion. You're going to be passionate about it. It's going to cost you something. And here this man takes his own supplies, his own oil, his own wine, pours it into the wound, binds the man, puts him on his animal, takes him to a place where he can have medical attention, be watched after, and then pays for it, and then says, if there's any more cost, I'll take care of it. And then Jesus says, now which of these people do you consider, do you think was this neighbor? Well, this fellow doesn't have any trouble whatsoever. He said, uh, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. Notice Jesus, you're probably the greatest example of mercy. Two blind men, you know, uh, chase after him. What do you want? Want our sight. What does Jesus do? He extends mercy. They see. The Syrophoenician woman, I'd love to spend a little bit of time with this because this, tr this passage always troubled me. Try to very briefly. Remember Jesus, this woman comes up to him. She's uh, not a Jew. She's from, he's up in the area of Tyre and Sidon, out, uh, you know, west and north of uh, where all the Jews live, running, you know, the Jews have been after him. And so he's up there, and so this woman comes to him because her, her daughter's possessed. And she says, Lord, please heal my daughter. Remember, Jesus says that he's, uh, it's not, you know, he's not supposed to, first of all, he won't even answer her. And then the disciples say, man, would you please deal with this woman? She's bugging us to death. And so what does he say? You know, it's not good to give the children's bread to the dogs. Well, immediately I thought, I can't believe Jesus called somebody a dog. That's terrible. Why would Jesus do that? Well, there's, there's a little play in the Greek there that you're not aware of. He's not calling her uh, a, a mutt that runs out there that's still in, you know, getting into people's garbage and, you know, wild dogs that were a threat in Palestine in the first century. He's talking about little lap dogs, little puppy dogs. And there's, that's a different Greek word than the mongrels you see. And he says it's not good to you know, give the, take the bread from the children, not let them eat, and to give it to the, you know, the table scraps to the dog before the kids have had a chance to eat it. But she, what does she say? But master, even the puppy dogs, you know, when the children drop something, they can eat that. And Jesus, you know, thy faith has made the, you know, I casted the demon from her daughter because of what she said in the faith that she had. He showed mercy to her when it was his intention, you know, just to work on the, the lost sheep of Israel. Matthew 17, the man possessed. Remember, Jesus comes off the Mount Transfiguration. The man has a, the, the King James says, lunatic. He's possessed with the devil. He says, please have mercy on my son. He throws him into the fire. He says, awful. Uh, and you got to love this man's statement. I know I'm pushed on time, but you can't talk about this man without talking about what he says because Jesus says, if you have faith, anything can happen. What does the man say? Lord, help my unbelief. Can't we all say that sometimes? Well, from the bottom of our hearts, we just say, Lord, yes, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Time to time, these thoughts come up. These that Help me with that. Oh, I just, that guy, he breaks my heart because I've seen myself in that so many times. Lord, help me with my unbelief. And, of course, Jesus heals that young man. And don't you know, whew, that had to put that over the top. Mercy developed. Well, how do we do that? Less TV, more Bible. Boy, that'd go a long way, wouldn't it? You think about how much time you spend watching television, how much time you spend with your Bible, and then after you get done crying, you know, change it. Let's spend more time with the Scripture and look at these things that can build us up and, and make us better. And not only that, but ask God. Any man lack wisdom, James would say? Let him ask God. Don't you think the same thing would apply? Lord, help me to be merciful. Help me to show more mercy. Of course it would. And then the reward, this reward's limited to a certain group, those that showed mercy. Now, this ain't how to be saved. But I have people very close to me and my family. I love a great deal. They would have thought if you showed a whole lot of mercy, then God would save you. If your good deeds outweighed your bad deeds, God would save you. But the Bible says one sin. The wages of a sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You've got to obey the gospel. That's how you're saved. And then finally, we reap what we sow. Even in this life, those that show mercy, you're going to have mercy extended to you, even by people in this life. People pick up on stuff like that. They, quick, they pick up on it quick. Let me share with you very quickly an example of mercy that just brings tears to your eyes. 
young man named Botham Jean. In 2018, he was accidentally, I want to say accidentally, he was shot in his own house, sitting on the couch eating a bowl of ice cream by an off-duty uh, Dallas police woman who had uh, just come off of, uh, of duty. She'd been, I think they even said she'd worked some extra shifts, whatever. She was on the wrong floor. It's like a lot of places, every apartment looks the same. Ever. She went in, she shot the man, she killed him. And... Uh, very remorseful about it, no doubt about it. This man's brother, by the name of Brant Jean. By the way, these folks are also members of the Lord's Church, uh, the, the young men. I don't know about, about the woman. This young man testified he got to do what, you know, a witness, uh, how it affects the witness statement, you know, the family, I'm sorry. Uh, and so he, uh, looking at this police woman, <clears throat> who had been remorseful, been crying and everything during the trial. <coughs> he said, I want the best for you. He says, I, I want you to know that I love you. I love my brother. I miss my brother. But I love you. He says, I don't even want you going to jail. He says, I want what's best for you. And then to blow it all, I mean, just to just put it over the top, he asked the judge, he said, I would like to give her a hug. Is it okay if I give her a hug? And that's exactly what he did to the woman that had taken his brother's life in an awful, I would like to think, accident. Uh, brethren, I just don't think you can get more uh, descriptive of what it means to show mercy. Here, a young man believing what this woman said about the death of his brother, and he was willing. Now, you let that sit for a moment. How would you have reacted in that same situation? Uh, I would like to think that I could be that merciful. I would like to think. That's mercy. That's mercy. When you are willing to forgive somebody of something that cost you something, and that cost him his brother's life. We are being held and hugged by the very, the very same thing, Jesus Christ. You might say, well, how in the world can a man forgive a man that killed his brother? And think about Jesus. Here you got a depiction of a man holding a nail in his hand, a hammer in the other hand, because this man, like each and one of us, might as well have drove the nails into the Savior's hands and into his feet, because all of us are guilty of sin. That's what the price had, had to be paid to fix that. That's mercy. That's mercy. If you're here this morning, you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, let me encourage you to do that. It comes by hearing you can't know what to do unless you've heard the gospel. Then it's followed by belief. You can't act on something you don't believe in. Jesus said you need to repent, and you need to be willing to stand before men and to confess his name. Last but not least, in this process of salvation, he says that uh, all that believe and are baptized shall be saved. Let me encourage you to do that. Maybe in times past you've left your first love. You're not as merciful as you ought to be. I pray that... Uh, You'll do what you need to do to make it right with the Lord. If it's something of a public nature, then we stand ready to assist. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you. As together we stand and sing. I
Brethren, if you would bow with me, please. Dear God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee now at this time, asking that you bless this loaf, which to us as Christians, dear God, is a representation of thy Son's body, which was broken and sacrificed upon the cross for the remission of our sins. May those that partake of this, dear God, do so in a manner that be well-pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. And in Christ thy Son's name we pray, amen. Continuing our prayer, dear Lord, we're thankful for this cup. This cup which represents the blood of thy son which was shed upon the cross for our sins. May we as the children of God partake of this in a way that will bring glory to honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sweet are the 